Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this um, recent seminar where we're going to talk about a sort of an update to the soil classification system. And before we get started, I wanted to just remind people that uh, much of what we say is contained in the CPT guide, which you can download from a number of different websites, the Greg one and my own and Geologist Mickey. And then, uh, of course, this, the other webinars that we've done are all recorded, just as this one will be recorded. So most of what you um, will hear today is in the guide, although I am covering what is in a new technical paper in the Canadian Journal. It'll appear uh, either next month or in, in the July issue. Um, so the guides won't capture all the details that we're going to cover, uh, but we'll update it and, and, uh, and you can download the slides as well. So uh, let's do a quick review of what the current soil classification systems are so we understand um, what we mean when we talk about soil behavior type. So the current system, the most common one here in North America is the unified soil classification system. And in fact, most systems around the world are based on essentially the same features as the unified classification system. And their physical characteristics, the physical characteristics of grain size distribution for coarse grain soils, and plasticity for fine grain soils. And so their definition of coarse grain soil is a soil where more than 50% is retained on the number 200 sieve. That's the point, 0 0.075 millimeter sieve size. And then a fine grain soil is defined as soil where less than 50% is retained on that 200 sieve. And then they sub uh, divide that into either high plasticity or low plasticity material. So that's the uh, background of what we traditionally use in geotechnical engineering. And some people refer to them as textural based. It's based on the texture of the soil. I sort of prefer the generic term physical characteristics. And they're determined on disturbed and remolded samples. You know, so for coarse grain soils, you, know, you take the, the, the sandy soil and throw it into some sieves and shake them up. And for fine grain soils, you completely remold it to determine the plastic and liquid limits. So there's somewhat of a weak link with the in-situ behavior because the in-situ behavior depends on factors such as geologic processes, environmental factors, and of course physical and chemical processes, which we'll, we'll talk a bit more about later. But it is reasonably successful in sort of giving you a sense of what the behavior would be as long as it's applied to sort of relatively young, uncemented, predominantly silica-based soils with limited stress and strain history. But when you get outside that bounds, then these physical characteristics have really just a very weak link to any in situ behavior. So if we want a system of classification that's based on behavior, um, then you know, ideally geotechnical engineers would like to have um, a behavior say, uh, a behavior based system that has a strong link to in situ behavior. Uh, but of course, a combined classification based on both physical and behavior characteristics is helpful. So I'm not suggesting we stop using the traditional um, textural based system like the unified classification system. It's just that we're going to supplement it with a behavior type uh, system based on the CPT. So before we get into how we're going to do it, let's sort of just review sort of generalized features of the way soil behave. And some key features, and I, I took this from Atkinson's textbook, which was a nice summary. It says, first of all, that soils have the ability to change volume due to the rearrangements of grains and void spaces. And we sort of often refer to this as dilative contractive response. So soils can either dilate and contract in, in shear due to a volume change. And then they're essentially frictional, where the strength and stiffness increase with normal stress and with depth. Um, and so you'll see later that's why we like to normalize data because we account for this stress dependency. And soils are essentially inelastic, where the response is nonlinear to loading beyond an initial very small th threshold strain. And so we're going to talk about small strain stiffness. Um, and the actual in situ behavior depends on many factors such as stress and strain history and the structure in the soil. So if we're going to have some behavior groupings, um, let's start off with what Idris and Bollinger had suggested some years ago, where at least for liquefaction, they talked about um, sand-like soils and sort of typically where the plasticity index is less than about 10. Uh, 
Um, they suggested seven, but others are sort of suggested it's maybe closer to 10, so I'm using 10. So sand-like soils are soils with the plasticity index less than 10, and they are susceptible to cyclic liquefaction. And cyclic liquefaction is where you can reach the condition of zero effective stress after cyclic loading with shear stress reversal. And clay-like soils tend to have plasticity index greater than 18, and they're not susceptible to cyclic liquefaction, which means if you cyclically load them, they do not reach zero effective stress. They always maintain some effective stress. They always maintain some stiffness and strength. Um, and of course, there are soils that are in transition between sand-like and clay-like. So somewhere between a, a plasticity index of 10 and 18 is where that transition zone that you can either be sand-like or clay-like, depending on other features. Um, depending on the clay mineralogy and, and a bunch of other things. Um, so this transition from sand-like to clay-like, in a way, is, is similar to the transition that the physical classification systems have, that transition from coarse-grained soils that are non-plastic to fine-grained soils that are plastic. And then the other key feature about soil behavior is dilatancy. We know that soils have this tendency for volume change during shearing, and we refer to this as dilatancy. And we know that soils can either dilate or contract during shear at large strain. So here's a sort of classic picture of, of a test in drain shear, um, sort of either loose or dense of critical state, or wet or dry if it's a clay. And we know that if it's loose or wet of critical state, then it tends to contract uh, to its critical state. Whereas if it's uh, dense or um, on the dry side of critical state, then it initially contracts a little bit, but then dilates to its critical state. And this is captured at the bottom here in terms of void ratio against shear strain. So the loose ones will contract, the dense ones dilate. Of course, we also know that um, these are at large strains when we talk about the oval dilatancy and contraction. And at small strains, most soils tend to contract. You see even this dense soil here, it's initially contracting before it dilates at large strains. And that's actually a key feature of why um, loose sands will experience cyclic liquefaction, sorry, sorry, relatively dense sands can experience cyclic liquefaction under cyclic loading, because at relatively small strains, they do contract and they will develop positive pore pressure. It's only when they deform under large strains that they begin to dilate, but they still sort of are classed as uh, liquefying. And then, of course, the other key element is that soils shear to critical state at large strains. So by the time it gets to critical state, it's lost any structure that it has. Um, and that, that, that's what we'll refer to next when we talk about structure. So when we talk about structure, you know, the powerful concepts of critical state soil mechanics were initially based on what I'll refer to as ideal soils. These are sort of young, uncemented, either clean silica sands or freshly deposited clays in the laboratory. And that was what the, the, the features of critical state soil mechanics were initially based on. Of course, they've expanded since then. But many natural soils have some form of structure uh, that makes their behavior different from that of ideal. And I'm going to use the terms uh, macrostructure uh, to refer to sort of the, the big features of layering and fissuring, which you'll see later the cone can pick that layering up quite nicely. But I'm going to focus in on microstructure. This is at the particle scale, which you don't tend to see. And that's due to things like aging and bonding, you know, cementation at the particle scale. So what causes microstructure? And uh, as I mentioned, it's sort of primarily aging and cementation. Uh, some degree weathering, cold welding, you know, is, is sometimes referred to as a cause. And then, of course, to some degree, the stress and strain history will also create some microstructure. And how do we identify this? And ideally, we use a combination of the background geology. You know, do, is the geologic history indicative of a, a much older deposit or a deposit that may have a mineralogy where cementation could occur? Um, and then, of course, the other option is sampling and lab testing. And then, of course, we're going to talk about in-situ testing, and we're going to talk about the seismic CPT, where you've got shear wave velocity uh, added to the CPT measurements.
So here I'm going to reference Professor Serge Louet back in 92. He sort of defined what he meant by sort of an ideal soil or a structured soil. And an ideal soil is the type of soil that's essentially elastic up until the yield point, and then it becomes plastic, and you have this well-defined relationship uh, that's controlled by void ratio and stress. And here in the bottom, when it shows the limit state or yield curve, uh, it passes through the critical state point. Whereas structured soils, what happens is they're elastic, but they go beyond the typical um, uh, limit state that you would have expected for an ideal soil, and uh, they go further. They're, they're stiffer and elastic longer until they reach yield, and then they plastically deform down. And so when you look at the limit state or yield curve, it's higher than critical state. So you know, the soil can be essentially elastic up to, uh, to yield, and then it will eventually destructure and come down to critical state at larger strains. So the, the type of uh, behavior-based um, classification that we're going to look at is where we use groupings um, based on um, whether or not the soil is structured or unstructured, whether or not it's sand-like or clay-like, and whether or not it's dilative or contractive. And then I'm going to also add in the feature of whether or not it's got some high sensitivity or whether or not it's non-sensitive. Now, one could argue that's tied into the dilative contractive behavior because um, sensitivity only comes when you have a contractive behavior. Um, but not all contractive soils are sensitive. So I, I add that as an extra criteria. And ideally, um, uh, we want a, a classification system that's based on simple, cost-effective, repeatable in-situ tests with multiple measurements. And of course, that's why we're going to talk about the CPT or the, the CPT with pore pressure measurements or the seismic CPT with pore pressure measurements. And that's the one I'm really going to encourage that we use. And uh, that's because it has the ability to identify soils with significant microstructure. OK, so when we talk about um, the seismic uh, CPT, here's a little sketch. It, it's, uh, I've sort of borrowed this from Professor Main. It's a nice little schematic of how the seismic CPT works. But in essence, you, it can measure the tip resistance, the sleeve resistance, the pore pressure. You've got geophones that can measure uh, shear wave velocity and also P wave velocity if, if, if required. And of course, if you do a dissipation test, you can determine the rate of dissipation, and that's usually captured by the time it takes to dissipate 50% of the excess pore pressure, T50. And then if you go all the way to equilibrium, you can get the equilibrium pore pressure, U0. And of course, cones will also measure inclinometer inclination, sometimes in both the X and Y direction. So you can see that you can have up to seven um, measurements from one simple in-situ test. And that's clearly the preferred way to go if you truly want to classify complex soil behavior. Obviously, one, um, one measurement is not sufficient to get detailed uh, behavior characteristics. OK, Cal, it's not moving forward. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, so this is the existing CPT soil behavior type chart. This was. Uh, developed over 30 years ago, and it was quite popular. So you've got uh, cone resistance on the vertical axis and then friction ratio. Now remember, friction ratio is the sleeve resistance divided by the tip resistance in percent. And uh, so this, this non-normalized chart was quite uh, pop has become quite popular. It's been around for 30 years. Uh, and we generally know that sandy soils tend to have high tip resistance and low friction ratio. And then clay soils tend to have lower tip resistance and high friction ratio. Most, most sort of normally and lightly overconsolidated soils tend to fit down the middle of the chart. Uh, but when these charts were first proposed 30 years ago, we did make it clear that they're behavior type charts. That's why they're called SBT, soil behavior type, because they're based on the uh, in situ soil behavior, predominantly controlled by strength, stiffness, and compressibility, which is not the same as traditional classification based on the physical characteristics of grain size and Atterberg limits. So it's important to remember that distinction. And then uh, about 25 years ago, you know, the, the general consensus would we need to 
move to normalize parameters, and this was Professor Roth was the first to really suggest this in 84 in his ranking lecture, and correctly so, because we know that soils are frictional in nature, so they, their um, behavior is stress dependent, and so we need to normalize the cone measurements as a function of stress so that we uh, account for that stress dependency. And he has suggested a normalized cone resistance as the net cone resistance, so that's the corrected tip resistance minus the total overburden divided by the effective overburden. And then, uh, so there's also a normalized friction, which is the uh, sleeve friction divided by the vertical effective stress. And then, as we had suggested, this uh, a sort of more popular parameter is this normalized friction ratio, which is the sleeve resistance divided by the net cone resistance in percent. And then if you've got pore pressure, initially we had suggested this BQ parameter, well others had suggested it, which is this excess pore pressure divided by the net cone resistance. But more recently, Schneider and others had said, no, a better one is what I'll refer to as this U parameter. And I'm saying U2 because the pore pressure is generally measured in the U2 position just behind the tip. And so that's the excess pore pressure divided by the vertical effective stress. So essentially you've got a, a net cone resistance divided by effective stress, sleeve resistance divided by effective stress, and excess pore pressure divided by effective stress. So those are the, the normalized parameters. But um, we know that when you get into sandy soils, just dividing by vertical effective stress, the, the behavior of sands doesn't increase exactly linearly with depth like it does in clay. So we need to have sort of a more nonlinear, uh, and so this sort of updated normalization has now become more popular. So it's referred to as QTN, N meaning it's a variable stress exponent N, and so you've got the net cone resistance now divided by atmospheric pressure to make it a dimensionless net cone resistance, and then there's atmospheric pressure divided by vertical effective stress to the power N. Of course, if N is 1, it drops back to the original form that Roth had. And so we know now that N is variable and it varies with soil type, density, and stress level, and that it's basically one in soft clays, but it can be about a half in dense sands. That's pretty well established. We know in the SBT world that the that um, correction factor CN is often to the power of a half. So that's fairly well established now. Um, and the atmospheric pressure is really a reference uh, pressure of typically 100 kPa. So uh, in 1990, I updated the chart to this normalized form and then sort of modified it in 2009. And so now you've got the normalized cone resistance against the normalized friction ratio. Now both on a log scale, um, and um, the, the zones are identified. And again, um, sandy soils tend to have high tip resistance and low friction ratio. Clay soils tend to have low tip resistance and high friction ratio. And then you've got the mixed soils in the middle. And generally, sands are free draining during the CPT, and generally the clays are undrained during the CPT. And so these mixed soils in the middle, like the silts, they, they can be partially drained. Um, but uh, these charts have become very popular, and they are in-situ soil behavior type charts. But the challenge has been is the descriptions that we've used of sands, silty sands, silts, and clay, they are the same descriptors that apply to the traditional textural physical characteristics uh, classification. And so that's created some confusion where people are not quite sure that there is a difference. And of course, I often get comments from people to say, well, your chart didn't work when I compared it to samples. But of course, they're comparing it to the physical classification whereas the, the CPT is a behavioral classification. And so what I'm going to propose today is really updating the chart and then switching to more behavioral type descriptions. And as we said earlier, that that would be based around things like, are they sand-like or clay-like? And uh, are they dilative and contractive and so on? And before I get there, uh, just a, a reminder that um, Jeffries and Davies in the uh, early 1990s, when they had sort of a slightly modified version of this chart, and they recognized that the boundaries that were uh, plotting on this chart when it's log-log um, scales were roughly concentric circles. And so they came up with this nice idea of this 
soil behavior type index, which was really basically the radius of these concentric circles as an approximation to the boundaries, as a very quick way of determining where you were on the chart. So you could combine the two, two parameters, QT and the friction ratio, and calculate the soil behavior type index, and then it becomes an index of the soil behavior. And so if IC is small, you're up in the sandy region, and if IC is large, you're down in the clay region. And it worked out that most soils cover the range roughly from about an IC of one all the way down to an IC of about four down in the uh, soft organic uh, clays. But the key to note here, it's not a perfect fit for the boundaries. It's a good fit down the middle of the chart where most young, you know, uncemented, normally consolidated soils fit. But when you get a little bit higher into the stiffer soils, it's not such a good fit. You can see it, notice here, the boundary of 2.6. Um, it doesn't fit the original boundary quite so well. And so a number of people have said these concentric circles aren't exactly a good fit to the, the soil behavior type boundaries. So uh, the first step uh, in wanting to have a behavioral type system is, first of all, can we identify whether or not a soil has significant microstructure? And the key here is that uh, the cone tip resistance, uh, the penetration resistance, is controlled primarily by the peak strength, whereas the shear wave velocity is controlled primarily by the small strain stiffness. So when you've got both of them, you've got a, essentially a measure of the peak strength and the small strain stiffness, and that gives us the ability to identify structure in the soil. In other words, whether or not the soil is somewhat unusual, where the correlations may not apply. And this was first su suggested by a graduate student of mine, Sohal Eslamizad, back in 96. And he had suggested this uh, plot of this ratio of G0. Now, G0 is just the small strain shear modulus, which is the shear wave velocity squared times the mass density. And just remember, the mass density is the unit weight divided by gravity. So it's essentially the small strain stiffness divided by the cone resistance. So it's a stiffness to strength ratio. And he plotted that as a function of the normalized cone resistance, which, and he was looking mostly at sands, which was essentially a measure of the relative density or the state of the sand. And so when it was low, you were in loose sands, and when it was high, you were in dense sands. And he observed that uh, most young, uncemented uh, sands fell within a very distinct narrow band. So the G over QT varied as a function of the state, and it fell within the narrow band. And that if soils were either cemented or older, then they tended to fall outside that band. And then uh, Professor Schneid in Brazil, uh, he added data to it, and he likewise said, that this was a good way to, to do with it. So 96 and 2009, so Esla Mizad and myself and then Professor Snyder had uh, made this observation. And then recently, um, James Snyder and Rob Moss had a very nice little paper in Geotechnique, in Geotechnique Letters in 2011, where they likewise made this observation. They added a lot more data. I won't show their data, but they, they did a lot more um, literature review and added more data to it. They saw the same effect, but more importantly, they came up with this nice little equation for the line, and they defined this parameter kg, and they, I, I like the form of their equation because it keeps the two parameters, so g over qt, and then uh, the normalized cone resistance to a power of 0.75. Initially, I had thought it was close to 1, but they said no, it actually fits uh, better to 0.75. So that's the equation we're going to use. And the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the chart and I'm going to put the normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis, and you'll see why later, because that will match the other charts. And then along the bottom, I'm going to put this G over uh, QC. Now, the only difference I'm going to make is uh, I'm going to call this the small strain rigidity index, because in a lot of soil mechanics, particularly cavity expansion, uh, rigidity index is defined as the stiffness to strength ratio. And that's essentially what we have. We have the small strain stiffness to the cone resistance, which is a measure of the peak strength. The only small change I'm making is I'm making it the net cone resistance, because when it comes to linking that to strength, it's really the net cone resistance that links better to strength. So it's only a small change, and in fact, for sandy soils, it makes almost no difference at all. And then their kg parameter, I'm modifying it slightly, and I'm calling it this normalized rigidity index, so k star g, 
And so this is this G over the net cone resistance times the normalized cone resistance to the power of 0.7. So a very simple little equation. And what uh, Schneider and Moss, and, and as did Eslamizad and uh, Professor Schneid, showed that most young uncemented soils have Kg values between 100 and about 300, or up to 330. With the average value being about 215 seems to be sort of an average value for young uncemented Holocene sands. Now the other thing I've done is I've extended it now down into the clay region down here. So I've taken it one more order of magnitude down into the uh, normalized cone resistance uh, where Ig gets a little higher for these clays. So I've just extended it a little bit. And I'm going to, I dug out um, about 30 a uh, little over 30 example sites from around the world. And I, I selected them from all over the world to sort of cover a range of sort of young uncemented soils through to uh, much older or cemented soils and even calcareous soils as a sort of a, a cross-section example. And I'm going to highlight some of those by showing you the actual data. But here I've got it illustrated where the red dots represent the, the sites that are predominantly young, uncemented, and of course the ones clustered higher up on the net cone resistance are mostly sandy sites, and the ones clustered low are the clay sites. And then the black squares are the soils that have some microstructure. They're either cemented or they're aged or a combination of both, and there's some silica sands in there. And uh, now, so what I'll do is I'll show you uh, these examples, and here's that note that the average normalized rigidity index for young, uncemented, predominantly silica-based soils is about a, a K star G of 215. And the next uh, category is really the dilatancy and contraction. And this is a summary plot. It was first proposed by Howard Pluis and colleagues uh, in Vancouver back in 92. Sort of I updated it a little bit, you know, mainly because of the, the different normalized cone resistance. But it's based on sort of extensive um, calibration chamber work as well as uh, the, the data that we got from the CANLEC sites where we did in-situ ground freezing to get undisturbed samples. And then, of course, it's supported by the theoretical work uh, that uh, Bean and Jeffries have done that was summarized very nicely in their, their recent book on um, liquefaction. Uh, and so what we've done is we've produced contours of state parameter, and essentially what it shows is the that with increasing dilatancy, these parameters tend to move up. And so the two red dots show that you can have two different soils that have the same level of dilatancy, the same state parameter, but different penetration resistances and different friction ratios. So they're essentially contours of dilation angle, which is a fundamental mechanical behavior. And these contours apply to ideal soils, predominantly young, uncemented, silica-based um, soils. It's important to keep that in mind. And then I wrote a paper in ASC in 2010 that looked at case histories where flow liquefaction failures had occurred and where they had high quality CPT data. And there were six sites that were identified. There's been a couple more added to it. But the key was is when you looked at all the data from the deposits that were considered to have had contractive behavior leading to flow liquefaction, all of those sites did in fact fit below uh, that boundary, if I go back, the boundary that um, Bean and Jeffries had suggested that had a state parameter of about minus 0.05. In you know, other words, just slightly on the um, dilative side, but uh, at large strains, essentially, that would be the boundary between contractive and dilative. And so you can see here I've drawn a boundary. It says it's uh, sort of a clean sand equivalent of 70. Now it captures all the data, and it's a little bit conservative. Uh, actually, the the, the sort of more realistic number is slightly smaller than that, and you'll see that later. And so these charts have evolved. So the one on the left is the one I suggested in 1990. And if I draw, the, identify the boundary that would sort of separate coarse grain soils, essentially sand-like soils, from fine grain soils, which are essentially clay-like soils, you can see that it's approximated by this IC of 2.6, but it works well for sort of um, normally consolidated soils, but not so well when you start to get into uh, a heavily over-consolidated or older or cemented deposits where the boundary 
uh, goes much more vertical than this concentric circle would match it. So that's been one of the challenges. It's not quite a uh, perfect match. And then James Snyder with uh, Randolph and Maine had a nice paper in 2012 where they had suggested sort of an updated boundaries and made them sort of more hyperbolic in shape. You know, when, when plotted on this log-log scale, they, they, they go much steeper vertically. Um, and you see it's similar to that red line, but certainly not uh, exactly the same as these circular concentric uh, circles. So they were suggesting a more sort of hyperbolic shape. Now, notice that the region they called transitional soils was certainly much larger uh, than what I would sort of suggest. And essentially, they were combining zones four and five, like the silty sands and the silts. They were combining and calling those transitional soils. Most people would say that the silty sands are, would be classed as sand uh, mixtures. So that's how it's evolved. And this is what I'm now suggesting. So the, the evolution is evolving a little bit further. So the dashed lines show the original 1990 soil behavior type boundaries. And now these solid lines start to identify behavioral boundaries. So first of all, there's one that goes across, which is that dilative contractive boundary. So the solid one is, is uh, captured by this simplified formula here. So I call it the CD boundary. And so here's the simplified formula. And when it equals 70, the, that, that sort of the conservative boundary. Now I do show a dashed line underneath when it's 60 as sort of uh, maybe less conservative but probably a little bit more realistic but in general sort of recommend that we go with the slightly more conservative boundary of 70. So that would uh, distinguish soils that are predominantly dilative from contractive and you notice I've curved it over here because in clay regions it's more controlled by over consolidation um, which is sort of the the fine-grained soil equivalent of, of state parameter. And then I have uh, show two sort of hyperbolic boundaries, so I'm steepening up the boundary that separates sand-like from clay-like, and I'm identifying this transitional zone, a bit like Schneider uh, et al. did in 2012. So now we've got this sort of six broad categories of you've got sand-like and dilative, and you've got sand-like and contractive, you've got clay-like and dilative, and clay-like and contractive, and then you've got this transitional soil that's either dilative or contractive. But traditional transitional soils, they tend to be sort of the silts. They, they're not necessarily silts, but they're behaving like silts. So, you know, no, I'm trying to avoid using those physical um, descriptors. So those are the broad six categories. And then I added one extra one, which is soils that are clay-like and contractive, but they have high sensitivity. Now, Previously, I had it as a zone tucked in the lower left-hand corner. Now I've made it a little bit bigger and a little bit more conservative. I've simplified it now with two straight lines so you don't have difficult equations to work with. Um, so I've made it a little bit more conservative. And you'll see from the examples, it, I think it works a little bit better. And the, the distinction between sort of clay-like soils that have um, low sensitivity from clay-like soils that have high sensitivity is a sort of sensitivity of around three or four. That's roughly what that boundary is at a friction ratio of about 2%. Now, um, um, Felenius has uh, suggested that he doesn't really like the friction ratio plot because if I go back to it, friction ratio includes the net cone resistance just like the normalized cone resistance. So they're not truly independent parameters. So he correctly suggests that a better way is really the normalized cone resistance against the normalized sleeve resistance. So that's sleeve resistance divided by vertical effective stress. And so here's that exact same chart, now just transposed into this format. And you can see the dashed lines show the original boundaries from 1990, and then the solid lines show these proposed behavioral ones. And I've also identified the limits of the previous chart from about 0.1% uh, friction ratio to 10% friction ratio. So exactly the same chart, just transposed over. Conceptually, it's better, but the problem is, is that it does compress the data. The data now gets compressed into a rather narrow band, and it does make it a little bit more difficult to sort of look at the data and see the trends. And that's why the friction ratio chart still tends to be quite popular. It's sort of the data can fill the chart, where it tends to get compressed in this one. 
So I'm only going to show this uh, uh, the net cone normalized cone resistance against the normalized friction ratio. That's the the one I'm going to prefer to show. But you could use this um, normalized um, friction resistance if you wanted to. Now a little bit of historical uh, reference here is Rick Olson way back in 1984, this was over 30 years ago, he had suggested probably the first version of any normalized CPT soil classification chart over 30 years ago. And here it is, it's got the normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis. Not exactly the same, but pretty close. These have units of stress because he's got the cone resistance divided by the vertical effect of stress to the power n. And he sort of identified that in SANS, N would be about half, and then N would go up to one in clay. So he, he, he predicted that that was the right way to go. He identifies sort of a normally consolidated uh, region, and he separated sands and sort of the silts and then the, the, the clays. So that was over 30 years ago. And if I transpose these new proposed boundaries on it, you can see that they actually match what he had suggested over 30 years ago quite well. You can see that the boundary between sands and the, the sort of transitional silt material uh, match pretty well. Uh, changes a little bit of, at high um, normalized friction. And, and of course, we've introduced this sensitive region. And I've also identified the bounds of about 0.1% friction ratio and 10% friction ratio. So really quite remarkable that over 30 years ago, he had the right idea. The only challenge I think he had was that um, People in industry just weren't ready to accept this concept. It was a little confusing back then. And so it, it actually has taken 30 years for the industry to evolve to essentially what he had suggested uh, back at that time. Now, uh, on the pore pressure side, uh, James Snyder and, and Randolph and Main wrote a very nice paper in 2008 where they had suggested an update to the pore pressure chart. And they had suggested using this normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis against this, what I refer to as U2 parameter, which is the excess pore pressure divided by vertical effective stress. And on the left here it is on a natural scale, and on the right it's on a log scale. The log scale is nice because it goes out to larger numbers, but the natural scale is a little nicer because it also can go negative. So you can see when data goes on the negative side. So I tend to prefer the natural scale, even though there's a certain um, harmony to use the log one, but the disadvantage with the log is you can't go negative. So the key here is that the excess pore pressure, this, this delta U2, is controlled by, primarily by shear induced effects at large strains. So this excess pore pressure is controlled very much by the shear behavior of the soil at large strains. And that becomes important when you will see that later. And they had identified some regions. And again, one of the challenges is that, that they were using slightly different terms than, than we had used. But they were still the textural-based ones from clays, silts, and then up to sands and identifying transitional soils. So what I've done is I've just modified this a little bit. Uh, I, I removed this separation between the transitional soils and the silts. And I'm basically just making them all uh, a transitional zone. And so this is what it looks like. And I've, I've changed the vertical axis to up to this normalized, the updated normalized cone resistance with the stress exponent against this U2 parameter, which is the excess pore pressure divided by vertical effective stress. So th these are the boundaries that Schneider has suggested. I just took out the upper boundary to make this transitional region. And you notice the only um, descriptions I put are primarily contractive because to get positive pore pressure, the soil's essentially got to be contractive. So the dilated ones will all plot uh, up around zero excess pore pressure or, or slightly negative. So I've indicated the sand-like dilated soils are tucked up here somewhere. But the key other difference I've identified is that um, Snyder had suggested correctly that when you've got sort of ideal, young, uncemented soils, that as they increase in over-consolidation, the ball pressure initially goes up as the normalized cone resistance goes up. But then it begins to turn around and begins to go dilated. So as the normalized cone gets higher in stiffer over-consolidated soils, the pore pressures begin to head towards negative. 
And what I've noticed is that, and you'll see this later from the case histories, that when you've got soils that have got increasing microstructure, there's a, there's a boundary here that when the pore pressures can get very high uh, combined with high normalized cone resistance, that's when you've got soils that have some microstructure. So the high normalized cone resistance is implying sort of a, a, a dilative response, but these very high excess pore pressures are suggesting a, a contractive response. And of course, that's what you can have when you've got soils with a lot of microstructure, is that their peak strength is high, which makes it look like it's dilative, um, but in fact, they can strain soften and have uh, very high excess pore pressures. So this chart's very useful. Of course, it tends to be limited to the fine-grained soils, because once you get into sands, they can be free-draining, you get no excess pore pressure, so it basically just plots around the zero. So sort of coarse silts and sands uh, can sometimes be partially drained, and so this chart becomes uh, a little less effective. And also, it's a challenge in regions where uh, either you're above the water table, so you, sh you have no excess pore pressure, or you're in ground conditions where the water table might be deep, or the soils might be quite dilatant, and so you lose saturation. So the accuracy of the pore pressure may not be so good. So the charts become very popular offshore, less so uh, onshore. So here's the, the proposed family of charts. So three charts, so you uh, the normalized parameters are the normalized cone resistance, normalized friction ratio, normalized pore pressure, and then this normalized uh, rigidity index, G over Q net. And so here's the three charts put together. And so ideally you would go to the shear wave velocity one first, so the um, norm normalized small strain rigidity index. First of all, see if your data falls within the ideal region. If it does, then you know that the main chart, which is the normalized tip resistance and friction ratio, is probably going to work pretty well. So the dilatancy and contractive boundary will apply because the soil essentially has relatively little uh, microstructure. If the soils fit in the region with significant microstructure, then you may need some local adjustment to the chart uh, due to this sort of more unusual behavior. And then the chart in the middle is the pore pressure one, that if you've got fine-grained soils, um, you can identify the difference between sort of ideal unstructured soils and the structured soils. So let's look at some examples. I'll quickly go through them. I picked out some selective ones from those uh, 30 sites. Uh, this one, of course, is uh, well known for me. I, I did my graduate work at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and the Fraser River Delta is a, is a nice site for testing. That's where we did all the early uh, CPT work with Professor Campanella. And so here's the Fraser River Delta, which is mostly uh, normally consolidated Holocene age sands over clays. And so here the, the yellow dots are the you know, slightly um, medium-dense dilative sands, and then the red dots are the um, sensitive marine clays underneath. And you can see the kg value is about 215, right where it should be. Sands plotting right up at the top, clays at the bottom, and then... Um, on the pore pressure charts, the clay data is plotting where it should, and the sand data plots exactly where it should. So a good example um, uh, of one site showing the, the broad ranges. Here's another well-known site, the Bothkenna site in the UK. This is a estuarine um, uh, Holocene age clay. It's uh, essentially normally to very lightly over-consolidated, slightly sensitive. And again, data plots well. Kg is 240 plots right in the clay region on the pore pressure data, and it plots in the sensitive, um, just on the boundary between low sensitivity and high sensitivity, and variable because the sensitivity is variable. Now here's one uh, closer to where I am. It's up in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco Bay is famous for its uh, clays. It's got the young bay muds near the surface, and then deeper it's got the old bay clay. So the young bay mud uh, near the surface, it, this is a site where there's a, an over-consolidated crust, so the main deposit plots with a very low kg, actually slightly less than 100, uh, you know, consistent with its very young age. Pore pressure plots right where it should for the uh, contractive clay, and of course it's a sensitive clay, so it plots right where it should. And the over-consolidated crust, you can see that the normalized cone resistance climbs, and it begins to uh, go into the transitional region, and then into the dilative region, so right near the ground surface where it's very heavily 
over consolidated from uh, the water groundwater fluctuations making the soil more sand like essentially uh, due to this very heavily over consolidated fissured nature of the surface crust and the pore pressure initially increasing and then beginning to decrease and eventually go negative uh, as the normalized cone resistance climbs and then the deeper old bay clay this is more variable, we see a bigger scatter, it's sort of a sandy, um, silty clay, so that the data scatters quite a bit more, and it's on the boundary between contractive and dilative, and so the pore pressure, sometimes it's sort of on the positive side, sometimes on the negative side, and of course the kg value is a little bit higher up at 300, consistent with its older age. And then probably one of the loosest clean sand sites in the world is the Holman sand in Norway. It's a Draman River deposit, a uh, very loose deposit in a quiet section of the river, and so falls within the sand-like contractive region. Uh, essentially it's free draining, no excess pore pressure. The kg value is 155, right where you'd expect it for a young uh, deposit. Now we're moving up into older deposits now. This is one of the UK clays. This is from the Mattingly Stiff Clay Site, the Galt Clay Site in the UK. So it's a much older deposit. It's a fissured glacial clay. Kg, of course, is increasing with age. Now it's up over 300. It's up to 360. And the pore pressures are negative. So the pore pressure chart sort of gets it wrong. It looks like it's a, it's a sand-like dilative material with those negative pore pressures and high cone resistance. And the normalized cone resistance and friction ratio chart sort of indicates it's a more clay-like dilative material, which is pretty well correct, but you can see that the charts start to disagree a little bit when kg starts to exceed that 330 value. So now uh, go a little bit higher, kg is up to 580 in this Cooper Mile. This is in the Charleston region of uh, uh, the US, and um, this is sort of a cemented calcareous clay uh, silt type material. And the kg value now is up at 580, much higher values, clearly showing it's got some microstructure. And uh, the friction ratio chart, sort of plotting in the contractive um, transitional region, you know, partly in the sand. And at shallower depth, uh, the data does, in fact, drift up into the sand region. And eventually, at very shallow depth, the Cooper Mile actually plots up into the sand-like dilative region. Now, the pore pressure is interesting because as the cone resistance gets higher uh, with depth, the pore pressure also keeps getting higher. So this increasing structure indicating a more contractive response, which is sort of disagreeing with the tendency of the dilatancy response um, on the friction ratio. So you can see the chart not working so well once you get a lot of structure, and the pore pressure chart being the one that's giving the much more meaningful result. And here's an example of residual soil. This is actually from uh, the University of uh, um, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And so it's a residual referred to locally as the Piedmont soil. So it's from the weathering of the underlying gneiss and schist bedrock. So it's sort of um, a silty, um, sandy uh, residual soil. And so you can see kg is very high out at 520. Pore pressures go negative. So it looks like it's a dilative sand, and then the friction ratio one is sort of falling on that boundary of dilative sand or, or transitional material. And then uh, locally here in Los Angeles, uh, in downtown Los Angeles, uh, the underlying soils get into this Pliocene, this is very old soft rock called the Fernando Formation. And uh, so in this particular location, it's essentially uh, a cemented silt. It's a siltstone. And so here, kg now very high out at 600. And uh, the, uh, the friction ratio chart is indicating it's sand-like and dilative. But the pore pressure chart, very high excess pore pressures are actually off the scale uh, on this um, excess pore pressure. And uh, you can see um, um, very high excess pore pressure indicating a very contractive response at large strains whereas the friction ratio is indicating a dilative response. And again, the pore pressure one tends to get it uh, um, better in this particular case. And then to close out, here's an example of a calcareous sand. This is data from Morocco in a recent publication. And um, 
So this is a hydraulically placed, uh, therefore very recent calcareous sand fill. And uh, so kg is high. Now even so it's young material, because it's calcareous and may have some slight cementation, kg is high at 380. Of course, uh, it's free draining, no excess pore pressure. And on the friction ratio chart, it says it's a dilative um, sand-like material, but close to the boundary, so not that dense a, a material. Now, in the Middle East, with these calcareous sands, it's quite common that people talk about uh, correcting it to an equivalent silica sand. And they refer to this correction as the shell correction, or the shell correction factor. And historically, that means that people have gone and done calibration chamber tests to try and determine what this correction is. But in fact, if you do seismic CPT, you can estimate it quite well by basically it's the ratio of the kg. So kg is uh, measured at 380, but the average value in young uncemented silica sands is about 215. And so if you actually take the ratio to this power because of the slope of the kg line, um, then it works out that you in fact would predict a shell correction factor of about two, which is actually what Debats and et al. had suggested based on their approach, and consistent with what a lot of the tests in the Middle East on some of these calcareous sands have shown, that because they're crushable um, and they also lightly cement, um, that you need to make a correction up to an equivalent uncemented silica sand, and that's because people wanted to use the traditional silica sand correlations. So, in closing then, some comments are, is that this kg value is very helpful to identify soils with little or no microstructure. So if it's less than 330, generally soils have little or no microstructure. If it's greater than 330, they have significant microstructure. And the, the charts and the empirical correlations to get geotechnical parameters may not always apply and some local modification is likely to be needed. So this is a critical first step to know if your correlations are likely to work. And of course, if it's fine-grained soils, you can also use that pore pressure U2 chart to aid in the identification of microstructure. In other words, if you get very high excess pore pressures with high normalized cone resistance, that's also an indication of microstructure. But that'll only work in fine-grained soils that will develop those excess pore pressure. So a couple of uh, other comments. Scale effects are important because shear wave velocity and hence G0 is often measured over much larger uh, depth intervals than the cone resistance. Cone resistance and hence the normalized cone resistance is often measured every um, centimeter or, or five centimeters, whereas the shear wave velocity is often measured averaged over uh, a meter or more. And so you actually have to average the cone resistance over the same depth interval that the shear wave velocity um, is determined um, so you can get that kg value. And of course, dissipation tests are always helpful to clarify soil type and drainage conditions, as well as the equilibrium water pressure. And of course, you need that um, to get the correct effective stress. And so myself and uh, uh, Dijon and Randolph have suggested that if the time for 50% dissipation is greater than about 50 to 60 seconds, then in general the cone penetration is undrained uh, and the soil is predominantly fine-grained. And of course, in soft soils where the cone resistance can be very low, you need to pay careful attention to the correct soil unit weight and of course the correct uh, equilibrium pore pressure so you can get the correct effective stress. And also I'm suggesting that for now we should continue to use the traditional IC parameter in the iteration to get the normalized cone resistance. It'll be a while before we, we switch over to a slightly modified um, soil behavior type index. So in summary, the traditional classification systems are based on physical characteristics and I think we, it's time now to move to more a classification based on behavioral characteristics and that is built around whether or not there's any microstructure, whether or not it's sand-like or clay-like behavior, whether or not it's dilative and contractive at large strains, and whether or not the soil has high or low sensitivity. So uh, all of this is going to be um, uh, described in a paper that's been accepted into the Canadian Geotechnical Journal. It'll appear in the June or July issue uh, online. And so, uh, and of course, these slides uh, will also be available um, for you to download from the website, as well as a recording of um, 
of this presentation. Now normally um, Kelly and I use two separate computers, uh, but this time um, we've had to use her computer because uh, the, uh, the WebEx software requ required the updated operating system and mine didn't, uh, hadn't, I hadn't installed it. So I'm going to read out some questions. Did I get to see this? Okay. So I'll read out some questions. And um, so here's one that says, when using microstructure chart, that's that um, IG one, how should one determine the mass density in order to calculate uh, the, the um, small strain shear modulus? That's a good question. And um, in previous webinars, we had talked about how you can actually use the cone data to estimate the soil unit weight. So the mass density uh, used to get G0 from shear wave velocity is the unit weight divided by gravity. And you can actually estimate the unit weight reasonably well from the non-normalized cone resistance. So actually, Kelly and I had a small paper in CPT-10, which is available online um, for free. And uh, we described how you could estimate the unit weight. And Professor Main uh, came up with a similar correlation. They're both almost exactly the same. They approached it differently, but they give essentially the same result. Um, and both, it's using the non-normalized cone resistance to get an estimate of unit weight, and you plug that in normally. And so some software programs like CPT will do that automatically. Of course, if you, if you know the unit weights, uh, that's an improvement because you, particularly if you've got organic soils or if you're offshore in very uh, soft sediments in deep water where the unit weights can be quite low. Um, so if you know the unit weight from sampling, then that's what you would preferably use. But if you don't and initially you want to run this sort of analysis, then it's reasonably good to make an estimate automatically. And in fact, almost all of those examples I gave, there was very little difference between using the CPT estimated unit weights and the ones that were given in the literature for the, for the, um, for the published sites. So next question is, how reliable is IC for over-consolidated soils, older soils or slightly cemented? Uh, that's a good question, and, and you know, one could argue that's, of course, why we're suggesting to switch to this modified soil behavior type index that I'm calling I subscript B. So it's sort of uh, soil behavior type index um, that's modified. Uh, that is probably a little bit better, uh, especially for the heavily over-consolidated or older deposits. So uh, for now, I'm sort of saying IC is not too bad, but uh, in the long term, we will switch over, and you'll, you'll see me um, give updates on how to do that. So here, here's a, a question from a, a grad student uh, that I know, Ali Reza. Um, so he says, uh, have, you, uh, ever, have you ever encountered a loose soil which has been cemented uh, and after ground improvement, say dynamic compaction, the cementation, is destroyed. Yes, there's been a number of cases uh, where um, lightly cemented materials, uh, you know, based on, on penetration resistance, they were thought to be um, relatively loose. And of course, this is particularly true for carbonate um, sand. So because of the cr crushability, they give low cone resistance, and people then do ground improvement. But of course, when they do the ground improvement, they destroy the cementation. And so in the short term, the cone resistance actually drops, even though they they saw volume change. So they, they did ground improvement. There was clearly densification occurred, but yet the cone resistance either changed very little or actually went down slightly. But in all of those cases, when they recorded cone resistance over a period of time of several weeks, the cone resistance usually rapidly picks up. And, uh, and that's, that's often because the microstructure is rapidly reforming you know, the cementation is taking hold again. And so that's reflected, yeah. um, that's, that's reflected um, in that kg parameter, that you'll see that if you measure shear wave velocity, kg will be higher than that 330 value, which is often a warning that you have some <coughs> microstructure that could get destroyed by ground improvement. So I recently gave a talk on ground improvement that discussed that very issue. <coughs> um, so the next question uh, from Costas, um, who's in New Zealand, um, and he's saying, 
will liquefaction assessment be influenced by kg? And the answer is yes. Uh, what I'm hoping to move to now is actually uh, um, a way of automatically adjusting the cyclic resistance ratio that you would estimate from traditional CPT approaches, but make it a function of kg. Now, several people have suggested this. Professor Andrus has already suggested that, and he called it an aging correction. He didn't use kg, but it was essentially, he used sort of the measured to estimated shear wave velocity ratio, sort of a bit complicated. I think kg might be an easier way to go. And, uh, and Schneider and Moss likewise uh, alluded to that fact as well. So I, I think that's going to happen. Um, we don't actually have all of the data right now to actually uh, to do it. But basically, it says that if kg is greater than 330, then there almost certainly is a, um, an, a benefit of the microstructure for earthquakes. Uh, I did have a small paper in ASC last year that, that discussed this. And one of the things I cautioned about is that if the microstructure is due to light cementation, that for small earthquakes, that would control. But for large earthquakes, the risk would be that would the earthquake be large enough to break the cementation? In other words, large enough to exceed the threshold strain and break the cementation and there, uh, therefore no longer get the benefit of that microstructure. So next one. Do you know if the new C petite includes the updated chart? Absolutely. That's why uh, one of the features of, of version two of C petite is that it now has these new charts in it. And in fact, all of those plots you saw were actually generated by uh, version two of C petite. So next question. Um, I have a question about the modified Schneider chart. Um, would you not expect to see excess pore pressures during C PT push in dense fine-grained soils that may be dilative under large strains due to volumetric strains during the push? Okay, good question, Jordan. And uh, I, I made a point of saying that when you measure the pore pressure in the U2 position, it's been shown quite clearly that that response is dominated more by the shear-induced behavior of the soil. Now, if you're measuring pore pressure on the face of the cone, yes, you'll measure very high positive pore pressures. But generally, if you're measuring pore pressure behind the cone um, in that U2 location, it's more controlled by the shear-induced behavior. And so if it's a dense, uh, fine-grained uh, soil that's dilative under large strains, then typically you'll get negative pore pressures. Now remember, it's negative of hydrostatic. They still could be positive pore pressure, depending on hydrostatic. And particularly if you're doing work over water, so there's a large back pressure of water from the depth of water, um, so you've got large hydrostatic pore pressures. So the soil dilates uh, and you get negative of hydrostatic. So that U2 value goes negative, even though the actual pore pressure itself is still positive. So it's an important difference. Next question, how would this classification system be used by Greg in the field? And how is that comparable data collected last fall? OK, um, so of course, one of the reasons the the non-normalized chart that I showed from over 30 years ago is still popular, is the fact that it uses non-normalized data. And you can actually use that chart in real time in the field. And that's why it maintains a certain level of popularity. And if you're doing you know, regular projects of an average depth of 10 to 20 meters, um, you know, those non-normalized charts do a reasonably good job. What I'm proposing is if you want to go to a more detailed interpretation of soil behavior, then you need to go to normalized data. And that's typically a post-processing. So when you get back to the office, when you post-process using software, and then, of course, you can put in unit weights and the water table so you get the, the piezometric equilibrium piezometric profile. Uh, then you can calculate the normalized values. So you'll get a better result, but it typically requires some uh, interaction with the data, uh, whereas the non-normalized the computer can do it for you in the field. So um, next one, uh, sometimes young sands and silts are associated with a high organic content. Does this alter U2 response and create a potential for misinterpretation of contractancy? Uh, that's a good question. Harold, yes, I recognize the name. Good to hear from you. Glad you're watching. 
Um, that's a good question. Uh, we don't have a lot of data, but I would sense that you know what happens is high organic content tends to make soils more compressible. So the cone resistance tends to be a little bit lower compared to everything else. Um, so it would be interesting to see what the KG looks like in highly organic silts and, and young sands. Um, there is a chance that it could be a bit like the carbonate sands, that KG could start to get higher. Um, so the warning might be that KG value could start to go high. Um, and then, of course, you're saying, does this affect the U2? Uh, I mean, U2, it, it, the pore pressure, if everything's working, if it's saturated, and if it's fine enough that you're, you're getting good measurements, um, U2 should still be ref reflecting the large strain shear-induced response of the soil. So if the soil is contractive at large strains, you should still see those positive excess pore pressures. So next question, um, are there currently any cone penetrometers field methods for simultaneous collection of pore water samples? Uh, yes and no. Um, there were a number of cones that were developed that you could stop and you could suck in a sample of uh, pore water to test, but they never became very popular. And that's because for environmental purposes, you had difficulties of cross-contamination when you could only suck in one sample. So why would you do that if you're doing CPT and you want to carry on pushing? So the general practice has been that typically people will do a standard cone penetration test first, and they'll get the stratigraphy. Then they'll move over and do uh, selective pore water samples using a soil sampler, uh, sorry, a, a water sampler. And there are various types of water samplers, but most of them, they're discrete. You lower it down, you take the sample, then you bring it to the surface, you decontaminate it, and then you go deeper and take the next sample. Um, I think the next one, does the weight of the, the, the CPT truck affect the interpretation? Uh, were the original curves developed based on uh, specific tonnage? And the answer is no. Um, most CPT, most equipment that's used to push the CPT, like those big trucks, the, the 20, 25 ton trucks, um, they have to uh, raise themselves up onto jacks to create a level, stable platform. And those jacks are a long way away from where you push the cone. You're normally pushing the cone from the center of gravity of the truck. These jacks are off at the corner, so they're a long way away. So typically the weight of the truck uh, has almost no influence on the, on the, the CPT data. Now, for smaller pieces of equipment that are anchored in place, where you install anchors, and the small pieces of equipment, these anchors are actually quite close to where you push the cone, but the anchors typically only extend one or two meters into the ground. And so ideally, with these little anchored rigs, ideally you should push the cone the one or two meters, then install the anchors, and then carry on pushing. So it's a small detail. Not everybody does it. So one could argue the data in the first meter could be affected by uh, the anchors installed nearby. But again, if the pushing is light, you're not pulling on the anchors very much, so the effect could be quite minimal. Uh, so I doubt that it has uh, uh, much effect. And certainly, uh, these charts and all the previous charts were not influenced at all by uh, the pushing mechanism. So last question, what interval do you recommend for obtaining shear wave velocity? Well, if it was a perfect world, we would go for continuous shear wave velocity. And there's a number of people, Professor Main and the, and the people at Contech, have been looking at uh, continuous seismic measurements. That's clearly where the future is going to go. So either having vibrators to create the source or um, rapid impact sources. Um, so uh, and right now, we typically stop, and every meter, we generate a shear wave, we measure its arrival, and then we repeat that one meter deeper. So right now, we're typically doing a one meter interval. Uh, you can do it at smaller intervals. Uh, it just takes a little bit longer. And uh, some people have uh, two sets of geophones, half a meter apart. So they've got the spacing down to half a meter. But um, what uh, Maine and, and the Contech guys have done is that by putting a sort of a rapid impact or a vibrator, uh, you actually could do it without stopping the cone. So you collect the data continuously while you're pushing it in. And so you could collect it every one or two centimeters. 
um, and that would be the ideal way to do it. That's an awful lot of data. I think that's where the industry is heading. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, in, I think the industry as a whole is not willing to pay for that service. Uh, but I think uh, as the demand for higher quality shear wave velocity data uh, grows, I think you're going to see the industry begin to offer uh, both true time interval testing over shorter intervals, as well as essentially continuous uh, measurements. Okay, well, that's the last of the questions. Uh, hopefully that was uh, uh, interesting, and certainly uh, a recording of the presentation will be available uh, uh, online with, you know, within a day or so, and a copy of the slides will also be available there uh, on our website. That's the uh, Greg Drilling website under the webinar tab. And of course, as I say, uh, a paper that describes everything I've said will be in the Canadian Geotechnical Journal um, in the next month or so, um, as long as I can get the final version of the figures in. Um, so thank you for attending, and um, we look forward to you uh, attending the next one.